Good morning. Good morning. Again. Okay. Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's another year. Are you ready for it? It doesn't matter. Here it is. I would like to read this little uh, ditto here. I read this article about a man who noticed one morning that his name was in the death column on the paper, in the obituary. What would you think? <laughs> well, he was a little upset about that, of course, so he called the newspaper office and he asked why they had put his name in the obituary column. Well, the man on the other side didn't know. He said, well, just a second. I'll go and check it out. So he came back in a short time and he says, yes, you are right. We made a mistake, but don't worry. In the paper tomorrow, we'll put your name in the birth column. <laughs> <laughs> but I like what the article says. When we are saved, we just read that, or saying that, our God saves. When we are saved, our name is put out of the death column of the dead in sin. And it's placed into the birth column of those who have been born again. Greatest question, and I want to share this this morning, that a man asked me when I was 20 years old. It's come to my mind this morning because I was talking to Tanner and he said he's 20 years old and I thought that's a great age. I was 20 years old. And I believed in God I went to church on occasion, and he says, John, if you died tonight, where would you be? Where would you go? Body goes in the ground, of course, but what about your spirit, your life? Where's it go? And I did not know. My mind quickly went through my short 20 years of life and, and I was weighing out the good and the bad, all the bad I'd done, all the good I'd done. Would the good outweigh the bad so that God would say, okay, come on into heaven. But I didn't know. I lay awake nearly all night. Of course, now I know it was the Spirit of God working on my heart and mind and my conscience, but... I didn't know, and so I couldn't sleep. How can you know? How can you know that you're right with God and that you're going to go to heaven? Well, the next morning, Ron, it was his name, he set me up. I was in his car. We pulled together going to work. Belmont, Michigan, Tuesday morning, 7 o'clock. And he says, John, would you like to know? I said, yes. John, you know you're a sinner. You've sinned. You've violated God's laws. In fact, there isn't anybody who hasn't. He said, I know. I've sinned. This is if you repent of your sin, turn to God and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Receive him as your Savior. Ask him to come into your heart and life. Believe. He'll save you. 
So that Tuesday morning in that 57 Ford, Belmont, Michigan, Tuesday morning, bowed my head in the car. I didn't pray out loud. I just prayed and I said, Lord God, I'm a sinner. I know. Please forgive me. And Jesus, I believe. I believe you died on the cross for me, for my sins, and rose again for my redemption. I pray that you'll come into my heart and life and save me. And I've told this many times, but I just love talking about it. I went home that night after work. My wife was in the kitchen. I can still see her in my mind in that little teeny house we had. She's at the kitchen there. She's been doing stuff. And I'm in my paint overhauls, white. You know how they were white? I know why they were white. They're all paint, you know, but white. And I come in there and I grab this little black Bible that my mom had bought me years ago. It was still like new because I never opened it. And I had the Bible and I sat down at the kitchen table. And I leafed through it and it just kind of opened up to John chapter 3. That's why it's one of my favorite scriptures. John chapter 3. Nicodemus come to Jesus talking about how great he was and all the miracles that he was doing and God had to be with you because no one could do these things unless, unless God was with him. And Jesus just cut to the chase. He said, Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Can't. And Nicodemus says, what? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus says, listen, that which is born of flesh is flesh. You have a natural birth, physical birth, but that which is born of the spirit, the spirit, born from above, a second birth, if you will, a spiritual birth, a birth that God does and gives us. Born again. Born again. And I read that. I pretty near jumped out of my seat. And I told my wife excitedly, Audrey. I usually call her Aud. I said, this is what I did. This is what happened to me. I've been born again. You should have seen the look on her face. <laughs> she thought I was crazy. A couple of weeks later, she come to the same place. Saved. Saved from God's wrath. Saved from hell. I was born again. Praise God. This story, I can't hardly believe this, but it's true. Dear Abby. How many remember Dear Abby? Remember Dear Abby? B.H. Colton. Ben H. Colton wrote her, Dear Abby, please explain in simple pool hall language what it means to be born again. And her answer was just wonderful. She said, that means they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and have put their faith and trust in him. I don't know if, that, if she was a believer or not, but sure sounds like it. She certainly knew the words to give. Going to the new year here. You don't know what's going to happen this year. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Our life. Just like we read, the point of another man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. Well, Jesus already took the judgment on the cross for our sins. Where are you at? Where are you at? Are you going into the new year being born again, saved? I hope so.
If you're here and you have not made that choice or that decision, I pray that you will. Pray that you will. Trust Jesus. Trust Christ. Turn to him. Repent. Turn to God. Trust Jesus. Believe the gospel. And ask Christ to come into your heart and life. He'll save you. You'll be born again. And your life will never be the same in this world. Praise God. I just wanted to share that with you this morning. Come of the new year. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you for the simple plan of salvation. Thank you that you have reached down to us through your son. You showed us what God is like. We discovered what we're like. Sinful. Sinful. Alienated from God. But he reached out in love. You reached out in love. Because God, you love the world so much that you gave your son, you sent your son, the greatest gift of all. And that whoever believed in him would not perish eternally, but have everlasting life. Thank you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this great plan of salvation that you've revealed to us through your word. We pray, Lord God, that you continue to bless your word to our hearing, to our hearts, that we learn, that we grow and understand. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If I was to ask you a question, by the way, Daniel chapter 9... Now, come on, we have been three weeks that we were not in that section. So I thought, hot dog, we're back into it again. The whole premise of what we're talking about is a tribulation period of which we've gone through much of that. And we're saying and asking the question, how long will it last? The tribulation, we've defined it and everything else what the Bible says. So how long will it last? Anyway, we found ourselves in Daniel chapter 9. Now, if I was to offer you a question, who has suffered the greatest persecution in the history of the world? Who has suffered the greatest persecution in the history of the world? What people group? The Jewish people. The Jewish people. Jesus himself would say in Matthew 24, 9, that they would be hated by all nations. Hated by all nations because of him. So much that history has recorded of the terrible persecutions of the Jewish people. In the early days of A.D. 70, Josephus stated, the historian, 50,000 Jews were killed in Seleucia. In Caesarea, which is on the coast, the Mediterranean coast, 20,000 died. They were constantly being threatened and many of them killed under the Roman emperors, especially Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Domitian, and Hadrian, and others. And of course, you know, history records over and over and over again, AD 70, the Romans under Titus, the general finally broke down the walls and marched into the city of Jerusalem, destroying the city, burning it with fire, smashing down, tearing down the temple, the most holy place 
and all the world for the Jewish people. One million three hundred thousand Jews died. One million, can you fathom that? One million three hundred thousand. That many or more went into exile, prisoners of war, if you will, went into exile and dispersed in the Mediterranean world all over. By the times Hadrian was there as the emperor of Rome, he was so disgusted with the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem that he literally had it plowed like a field. Busting it down, plowing it like a field. Destroying it, he thought, forever. And renaming Judea, no longer Judea, but renaming it Palestinia. It bears that name today. Palestine. Palestinia. In honor of the Philistines. Which, by the way, is Gaza. Present day Gaza. Where so much turmoil comes from. Palestinia. He renamed Jerusalem even. Aurelius Capitolinia. Aurelius after himself and Capitolinia after their patron god. Lots and lots of persecution to the Jewish people. What about the Holocaust during the war? <laughs> Six million Jews slaughtered, killed, gassed, incinerated. Six million. Six million. And I thought about all that. And I asked the question, why? Why? Why the Jewish people? Of all the people in the world, why the Jewish people? There's lots of other people, lots of other nations. Why them? Why so much persecution? More than any other person. Millions and millions. Why? And I can tell you the answer. Because they're God's chosen people. God chose them. Not because they were good. Not because they were righteous. Not because they were numerous. Just because he loved them. He chose them. And he said, you, you will be my treasured possession. Exodus 19 and 20. Deuteronomy. You will be my treasured possession. And he made covenants with them and promises. They've been unfaithful. They've been unrighteous. And he used many of these things as discipline, punishment. But they're still his people. And I think about all of that. And then what Jesus said in Matthew 24. In verse 21. Future tense. Then there shall be great tribulation. Jewish people, nation of Israel. Then there will be great tribulation unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again and if the days weren't shortened no one would survive no one but for the sake of the elect those days will be shortened Of all that they've gone through, of all that has happened to them, the worst is yet 
to come. The worst is yet to come. Now, when Daniel, in chapter 9, had come to the realization, it says in the first opening verses of Daniel chapter 9, that they were, who were in exile now, were coming to the end of that period that had been prophesied, that had been told by Jeremiah the prophet, 70 years, you would be in exile, you would be in captivity, but then after 70 years, God says, I will bring you back to your hometown, your homeland, to Jerusalem. And he realized we're coming to that point. And so he prayed. If you read Daniel chapter 9. And he prayed to the Lord God and he confessed his sin and he confessed the sins of the nation. And he pleaded with God. Make it so. Bring us back. Come back to our own land. But the thought is, is that now the kingdom will come. Israel will, will prosper. Israel will be the greatest nation in the world because God will be there. The Messiah will be there. In Jerusalem, the temple will be there again. And, and that's the whole thought I'm thinking that he's thinking that's what's going to happen. Hold your finger there and turn to, this is just off the cuff, uh, Isaiah chapter 2. Turn to Isaiah chapter 2. Let me hear those pages flicker. This is what they were looking for. What God had promised through many of the prophets. Isaiah, one of them said, these words, Isaiah chapter 2, look at it. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, that hasn't happened yet. We're in, but in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple, Moriah, Zion will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. All nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many peoples. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. <clears throat> Universal peace. Jerusalem will have the primary position in the world. And Israel will be in their land and chief among all the nations of the world. And people will come, other nations, dignitaries and other people, come to Jerusalem and to the temple. No longer serving false gods, other ideas, coming to the true God. Jesus, who will be there ruling. And so Daniel is thinking, ah, oh, this is going to happen finally after the captivity. We're going to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And, and maybe the kingdom is going to come. The Messiah is going to come. And all this is going to happen. But God says, no, not yet. Not yet. Remember the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel. I'm back in chapter 9 again, Daniel. <laughs> the angel comes, Gabriel comes to Daniel and tells him the, the timeline, the history of the nation of Israel and Jerusalem. I'm here to tell you, he says, Daniel, verse 24, 70 sevens are decreed. There's no guessing, there's no hoping, there's no changing. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people, Daniel, the Jewish people, Israel. Your city, Jerusalem. And when he comes, 
And all of this happened when this, the 77s that finally uh, ends, comes to an end, all this history of Israel goes and comes, then these things will have come to pass. Transgressions will be finished. An end to sin. Atonement made. Everlasting righteousness. Sealing up vision and prophecy no longer needed. God's here. Jesus. And to anoint the most holy. Either the temple or the Messiah himself. Jesus. To anoint the king. All of that will happen at the end. But there's 77s that are going to occur before that happens. 77s. So that's where we were. That's where we left off. And I got time for one point. So you can say that with joy in your heart that in the new year the pastor only had one point. <laughs> Daniel's prophecy. God's timetable for Israel given in four short verses. Now, other prophets talked about some of the stuff, too, but Daniel was given so much of it right there in a nutshell. Daniel's prophecy, God's timetable for Israel given in four short verses. Now, verse 24 again, let me read the first part. Where Gabriel the angel, the same one who would come to Mary and tell her she's going to have a child, even though she'd never been married, never had sex with anyone. The same uh, angel that came to Zechariah and said, your old wife, you're old and your old wife going to get going to get pregnant and you're going to have a son. You're going to call his name John and he's going to be the baptizer. He's going to prepare the way before the Lord, the Messiah, get people's hearts ready. This is that same angel, Gabriel, Gabriel. Speaking to Daniel, the message from God. And he says in verse 24, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city. 70 sevens are decreed. It's clad in iron. It's unchangeable. For your people, Daniel, and for your holy city. Jerusalem. So the first thing we can do before we go through all of that is to understand the term 77s. 77s. Now we've mentioned in the Bible uh, before in the Bible that seven is the number of completion, the number of perfection. It's God's number, if you will. How many days of creation? Six. God created six days. But then on the seventh day, what did he do? <clears throat> Ceased. I don't like the word rested because that sounds like he's tired. Ceased is the word. He ceased. Why? Because everything is complete. Everything is perfect. Finished. Complete. Seventh day. And all the way through scripture, seven, seven, seven is seen so many times revolving around that idea. We mentioned before in the book of the Revelation, which really we're in, the book of the Revelation, seven is mentioned 54 times because you're, in, you're at the end. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Everything's happening. Come to the end. So here's the term, 77s. For the entire history of the Jewish people, Israel, before or leading up to the coming of the Messiah and the kingdom, the kingdom. 
So we need to understand that term, 77s. Okay, here we go. A little bit of time. Don't look at the clock. 70 is a Hebrew word, sibium. Sibium, 70, a number. It's just a number. It's used frequently in the Bible, multiple times, 70. It's a number in the Bible. Sometimes there's a little bit of figurism in there, but most of the time it's just using a number, 70. Daniel 9, verse 2, we looked at that. Daniel come to the idea that Jeremiah had spoken about the desolation of Jehovah would last 70 years. There's that word, 70 years. In Genesis chapter 50, in verse 3, Jacob and all of his family is down in Egypt, of which 400 years later they will be delivered by Moses. But he's down there in Egypt, and he's an old man, and it finally says that Joseph closed his eyes to death. He died. Jacob died. And so Joseph, being down there in Egypt, and leader and ruler, second unto Pharaoh, he had his father embalmed. I could tell you what, what that was like, but I'm going to gross you out. He was embalmed. His own special embalmers embalm his father. And it states in there, the course of the embalming took 40 days. 40 days. You say, wow, the bodies start corrupting and get pretty nasty. Well, they want a part of the embalming for seven or eight days. They would completely saturate the body in saltpeter. And then they would cover it with pitch and gum resin before they wrapped it in the cloth. Anyway, 40 days of bombing, but it says that the Egyptian people, because of respect for, for Joseph, and perhaps respect for Israel or Jacob, because he was a prince, mourned for him 70 days. Mourned for him 70 days. You can read the story. Exodus 24, 1 and 9, God is going to meet, he's called Moses and he, his brother Aaron and, and Aaron's two sons, Eli and, and Nadab, up to the mountain, Sinai, up to the mountain. He's going to ratify the covenant. You know, the two stones and the tablets that it's going to write. He's going to ratify that. And so that covenant. And so he calls them up there. And with them, he says, bring 70 elders. 70. Why 70? Well, that's just God's number. 70. Up to the mountaintop. And eat. Covenants were always ratified by the shedding of blood. In fact, that's what the Hebrew word covenant means. Cutting, cutting sacrifice, shedding of blood, and then they would eat. They would eat the meal, ratifying the covenant. So the 70 elders were there, and, and uh, Eli, and, and Nadab, and Aaron, and Moses, and Joshua might have been there too, I don't know, but anyway, there they were, 70. That's the word, 70, 70, sabim. But when we get to the word seven, that is a different word. Seven is the word Shavuah. Shavuah. In your translation, if you have a, a King James, Old King James, even the New King James, it may be translated here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 70 weeks. Many of them have that translation, weeks. Because you can translate it that way. It can mean week, it can mean seven. The idea is group of seven. Group of seven. That's what the word means. And everywhere you see it, that's what it is. It can mean seven of anything. Seven of anything. A group of seven of anything. And so in scripture, many times, it is used for a group of seven days. What do you call a group of seven days here, even in America? A week. And so that's why I translate it that way sometimes. A group of seven days, a week. Hmm? A group of seven days. Genesis 29, of course, 16 through 30 is a story of, of Jacob. I can see I'm not going to get through this even. 
Jacob, remember? He flees from his brother Esau because he stole the birthright and he was a deceptive, deceptive man and he, and he flees and he ends up in Haran, which is up in present day Syria actually, over by the Euphrates River in the north. And lo and behold, he ends up at his uncle Laban's dwelling. And he's down at the, uh, he's down at the, the well where they water the sheep. He's got a big stone over it. He's down at the well where they water the sheep. And, and so he goes there and all of a sudden uh, the sheep are gathered around there, but nobody there to water him. And then some other shepherds come and then he says, uh, is this your well? And they talk about that and stuff and says, well, the, we, we wait because until the shepherdess comes, the, the one who really owns the, the well and stuff, she has to come first. And here she came. Rachel. And Jacob's eyes fell out of his head. And it states in there that Rachel was very beautiful and very shapely. And you know the story. Jacob's so enamored by her and wants her for his wife. But he tells Laban, I will work for you how many years? Seven years. A week of years for her. And of course, you know, he worked seven years and it seemed, the Bible says it seemed like a day. He was so in love. Oh, so in love. And so at the end of that time, remember what Laban did? They're all partying like you were all doing last night. All partying there. They were playing and they were dancing and they were you know, drinking a little bit of the fruit of the vine and stuff. And uh, when the bride would come, they would be completely covered. Covered. And so they brought the bride to Jacob hot dog. And he took her into the tent and they consummated the marriage. But in the morning when he came to, <laughs> he looked and wow, there was Leah, Rachel's sister. And he's pretty upset. How could you deceive me? The deceiver says. How could you deceive me? And so the Bible specifically says that Laban says, well, it's not right to give the, the, the younger before the older. And so we had to give you the older first. But you can have Rachel if you go ahead and work for another seven years. You're gonna, but he says, fulfill this one's bridal week. Seven days of feasting the bridal week. And then work another seven years for Rachel. Though he married her now for Rachel. Seven, 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 seven. We, it's the same words used all the way through scripture. I got a lot more. See all that? <laughs> but I'm running out of time. Quite frankly, I was thinking that John, when he's up here, he's going to start preaching. <laughs> and that would have been good. We'll finish up that section Understanding 77s. Oh, by the way, I wanted to share this with you. You people who are as old as I am or, or nearly, you remember the show on TV? 77. I knew you knew it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word, and we want to know it. We want to know the truth because we believe it to be true, and we believe that we are in the end times. And we believe and we should look for Jesus any moment. We went through this year, didn't happen, but it can. The imminent return of Christ for the church. May we be looking upward. Waiting, looking, even longing for his return. We thank you for your word. 
In Jesus' name, amen.